Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's SANS webcast. CCE, INL's new approach to securing critical industrial infrastructure, sponsored by CyberX. My name is Carol Auth of the SANS Institute. Today's featured speakers are Andy Bachman, Senior Grid Strategist, National, Homeland, National and Homeland Security, and Phil Nire, VP of Industrial Cybersecurity for CyberX, who will also be moderating today's webcast. If during the webcast you have any questions for our presenters, please enter them into the questions window located on the GoToWebinar interface at any time. Please note that this webcast is being recorded and a copy of the slides and recording of this webcast will be available for viewing later today and can be found on the SANS registration page. And with that, I'll turn the webcast over to Phil. Thanks, Carol, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to another SANS webcast. We're thrilled today to have as our guest Andy Bachman from Idaho National Labs. He's going to be kicking off the session with a description of a new approach for securing critical infrastructure. And then I'm going to be following that with uh, some updates on recent cyber attacks that are relevant to some of the things Andy's going to be talking about, and then how continuous monitoring and automated threat modeling can help implement the methodology that Andy's going to talk about. So now let me hand it over to Andy. And Andy, start off, please, by telling us a bit about your background. OK. Hi, everybody. Thanks, Phil. Thanks, Carol. And, um, and I sure will. Uh, let, me, let me just make sure I can get the slides working. Okay, so uh, I'll skip really quickly through uh, origin story. Uh, started off in the Air Force doing comms and computer work, a little bit in the U.S., a little bit in Europe. Uh, was in multiple cybersecurity startups, uh, which is an exciting opportunity, as uh, Phil can probably attest. And anybody else need, should try it if they haven't already. Um, was acquired into IBM, and for four years, I, uh, I, I parlayed my experience in those cybersecurity startups. I had also been blogging on energy subjects at night, moonlighting, uh, into a, uh, a really great position at IBM, helping uh, herd our security cats on energy sector projects uh, around the world. Uh, became an independent consultant for a year, year and a half, worked with the Chertoff Group in Washington, and finally was presented with a job description from the Idaho National Lab that was too good to turn down. It was such a perfect fit and opportunity. So I said yes, and I just had my four-year anniversary uh, in July of this year. So that's how I got there. I have been in the DOE and National Lab Complex long enough so that I'm not a complete neophyte, uh, constantly tripping over myself and our policies, uh, but not so long that I feel super well-versed. I still have a lot to learn as a, as largely an outsider to, to government. So that's, a, that's the background. The title of the slide is, is at least a, my attempt to begin to suggest pivoting from, um, I'm gonna use a term now that, uh, that uh, rankles some people, uh, to, so I'm gonna bring up cyber hygiene. And uh, to that I'll also add, some ways it's a synonym, in some ways it's an extension, uh, best, cyber best practices as outlined by the SANS Institute and others uh, that describe all the things that a company or a government organization needs to be doing uh, if it wants to make itself as secure as possible. Nobody ever says perfectly secure, uh, not nearly so, but if they want to do all the things that experts recommend they do, uh, there are the SANS top 20. And thanks again for SANS uh, for uh, supporting this presentation today. The uh, title suggests that even if you were to do all of those things uh, perfectly, comprehensively, and uh, to never stop doing them, to always keep them completely up to date, in a, even in a large enterprise, um, that that still will not uh, guarantee success. Uh, I think I'll get to it a little bit later on, but I won't be talking too long. <laughs> I promise. Phil, Phil has uh, some good stuff to share as well. And I'm saying there's a reason when we see successful uh, targeted attacks time and time again, there's a reason to not trust you know, solely in doing cyber hygiene and best practices for cybersecurity. There are a couple things that are being developed that go beyond that 
uh, that, that include that work but go beyond it uh, and are specially targeted for things that simply cannot be allowed to be to be reached by uh, digital means by attackers. So let me see if I can advance a slide. Quick, quick uh, update on Idaho for people that aren't familiar with the Idaho National Lab. It's one of 17 or so DOE national labs in the complex. We do work for uh, energy and energy sector and utilities, uh, certainly for the Department of Homeland Security and the Department of Defense. And uh, we work with suppliers closely as well, suppliers of energy infrastructure, uh, equipment as well as security suppliers on the products and services side. Um, one way to think about these types of places, the, these national labs, is that uh, part in the middle of the slide there that says we do what universities and industry industry can't, uh, won't, or shouldn't. And uh, that may mean there's not an economic uh, reason for doing a particular type of research. It's too far in the future. It can't be monetized yet or it's too dangerous because we deal with things that blow up or radiate, um, or we deal with national security and classified types of information, just things that are beyond the means of a standard university or company to be able to grapple with. So that's it. It's in the southeast corner of Idaho, which is a beautiful state. If you ever never had a chance to, to visit it yourself, I recommend it. Okay. Uh, why is uh, Idaho? You may some some people who aren't familiar uh, will say, why did this uh, expertise emerge in this far-flung state in a remote part of the country? And uh, the short story, uh, at least my version of it, is that this place has been dealing with dangerous nuclear processes for quite a long time. It's built 52 nuclear test reactors since the 50s, and it's pretty soon going to be building uh, its 53rd in the small modular reactor. Um, when you're dealing with uh, materials and processes that are this dangerous, this hazardous to human health, uh, imagine uh, in the early days, well before digital, digitization and automation, it still behooved the engineers to monitor and control these processes from a safe distance, as far away as they could get, to be, to be honest. And as uh, the uh, computer world emerged, we starting to start, they saw themselves using some of that uh, technology to be able to do an even better job uh, working from a distance, again, monitoring and controlling these dangerous processes. Once uh, Clifford Stahl's book came out, uh, The Cuckoo's Egg, and everyone started to realize that these systems could be uh, used for nefarious purposes, uh, Idaho, I think, is among the very first places to say, uh, hey, industrial control and of uh, dangerous processes by digital means uh, there's a way that that could be usurped by adversaries, bad guys, or people just playing around and uh, bypass all the safety that we've built into these systems. We better get expert on that real quick. And that's uh, precisely what started happening a few decades ago and now continues uh, apace at the Idaho National Lab. I have a couple of heads to show you here um, because I think these guys uh, provoke the right type of thinking for what follows in the rest of uh, my half hour presentation. This is uh, Dan Gear uh, un of, of unorthodox, uh, unorthodox sideburns perhaps, but completely brilliant person if you haven't had a chance to read his work or hear him speak about once a year, he produces uh, a keynote address, which is just uh, stellar. And uh, this particular piece uh, or the reference here is to about a, I think it's 12 or 13 page short paper he wrote for the Hoover Institution called A Rubicon. And uh, out of all of it, it's just fantastic and pretty scary. Um, it all boils down to this one quote from him. Uh, all of risk, the source, the wellspring of risk is dependence. So you uh, build yourself a process, your company runs on critical processes, and, uh, and they're automated and you're getting even more dependent on automation and perhaps machine learning and AI. That's all fine uh, from a risk point of view, as long as you have a plan B and uh, maybe a plan C. Uh, if you're able to switch over into something that's perhaps a little bit less efficient, uh, a little slower, a little less perfect, but uh, you, have high, you can have high confidence that it will be there if a uh, black swan or dark cloud, dark cloudy day comes your way, for your uh, software-based systems, then that's fine. 
It's only if we make ourselves 100% completely dependent on these systems uh, that we are hanging uh, over a cliff, either a little bit or a lot. We need to do something about it. We shouldn't just be accepting it as the only way to play in uh, 2018. So that's something to think about from uh, Mr. Gear or Dr. Gear, I believe. And now here's, a, here's another one for you. The uh, very provocative at the bottom of the slide, Bruce Schneier with his new book, Click Here to Kill Everybody. He himself admits that that's overkill of sorts, but it certainly will get attention. And it actually is, uh, it is related to the, the theme of his new book, uh, that as we uh, put computers in everything, everything becomes a computer, becomes a networked computer, and uh, we are piling on the risk again and uh, making ourselves depend on technology that's so complex that we can't understand it. And if we can't understand it, uh, we can't, uh, we have, we struggle to do a good job uh, knowing how to secure it and keep it secure. Uh, his point is uh, in the quote up top, isn't to put everybody into the fetal position, however, he's saying uh, in ways uh, similar to Rob Lee, who describes defense, who says defense is doable, He's saying these challenges of securing these systems and, and thinking about how to design them for the future is uh, super hard, uh, but it's uh, of a doable type hard, like man of the moon, not impossible hard, like faster than the speed of light travel. So there's Schneier for you. I'm about halfway through that book, by the way, and I, I, I do recommend it. He's a, a decent writer and a good thinker. Okay, uh, now we're gonna start to pivot into, uh, uh, take, take a run at the CCE, which is, which spells, sorry, stands for Consequence Driven Cyber Informed Engineering. I'll get to that more in a second. But in a sense, uh, this is stuff that comes from the INL playbook. Our uh, place, our uh, organization is populated by uh, engineers and by cybersecurity experts and safety systems experts and human behavioral experts. Um, they, uh, many of them have been on the offensive side of cyber operations in the past, so they know how to think like an adversary. Um, here we go, a couple easy steps. And this is the part that causes some problems for some folks, that, that, it, that perhaps I overdo it. Um, if you are a critical infrastructure provider, uh, you will be a target of adversaries, nation state adversaries, terrorist adversaries, criminal syndicates potentially, but certainly on the, na the nation state level, if you run critical infrastructure, you are a target. Now, that doesn't mean that you will necessarily be exploited. Here's my little caveat. But you should definitely be well aware that you are a ripe target for an adversary and should be preparing accordingly. The second bullet here, current understanding of cyber risk, which usually means it's usually informed by having a chief security officer or a CISO reporting to a CIO in an electric utility. In some industries, the chief, the person uh, with the most senior person with the word security in their name reports higher up than the CIO. They'll go straight into the chief in, uh, executive officer or the COO or the general counsel or chief risk officer. But the way governance is run today and the way um, we do cyber hygiene and best practices, uh, from what we can see, people don't fully understand the amount of risk that they're carrying even as they attempt to do the best things that they know how to do, hire and train the best people and uh, increase their budget every year. So the third bullet then follows, that if you're to focus, if you're in critical infrastructure and you focus solely on cyber hygiene slash best practices, uh, you need to do that. Sorry, I mean, you need to focus on those things, but for things that must not fail, that's not gonna be uh, a guarantee that those things won't be uh, compromised in some way and that uh, the worst case scenarios will will come to pass. The very bottom part of this slide is referring to the pivot into engineering practices. So not just looking at going to the Moscone Center and buying uh, defensive security products, the best, the new ones that come out every year, but actually uh, bringing some good old fashioned proven engineering practices to bear and combination of which can actually make us much more defensible. All right, so here it is then. Uh, with You don't need to pay too much attention to the colorful charts on the right-hand side, uh, but I'll walk you through the phases briefly. The first step of uh, this four 
step or phase uh, methodology is called consequence prioritization. And it simply means Say you have a large enterprise with thousands or, sorry, probably more likely millions of endpoints, and you have a, a security team in the dozens or maybe hundreds, depending on how you're funded. You do your best to do those best practices uh, all across the enterprise uh, waterfront. It's a good idea to try to keep everything secure because you can get in in one place, an adversary can, and uh, navigate across the network and reach a target. But what we try to say right up front in this process, by sitting down with the CEO and his or her uh, first, uh, first rank senior uh, uh, officers, by chatting with the board, and uh, then by working our way down a little bit into the, the mid-ranks operational and engineering type folks, is uh, try to get at the comparative handful of processes or functions that simply must not fail. The reason we use this term is, uh, it's, we're in the realm now of corporate viability or strategic business risk. You know, there's things that can hurt a company, and then there's, there's events of such a nature that they can end a company. All right. And so we try to get as quickly as possible, and I'll show you a way we, uh, we weight those in a second. Try to get as quickly as possible to a handful of scenarios that we can work with that, uh, customer on and help illuminate the, the true level of risk that they have there, and then begin to develop some practical mitigations for those things. So consequence prioritization is uh, admitting you have a huge uh, bunch of stuff to protect, but identifying the, compar the subset of it all that um, no one in leadership would uh, tolerate uh, any type of exposure uh, to because they couldn't imagine uh, losing those things and keeping the company afloat. The second step is uh, system of systems analysis, uh, phase two here in the middle of the chart. That means that for those handful of most critical processes or functions, identifying in, in a, a, a way that's more detailed than probably most or maybe any companies have really put themselves through yet, uh, a full-blown inventory of all the hardware and software and networking and people and processes that uh, support uh, those most critical functions. So we're talking, for example, at uh, a particular uh, computer, let's say there's an operating system on it and some applications. So for that operating system, we'd want to know who, who made it, if it's Microsoft, for example, and then we could say, which uh, version of it is it? Is it, uh, or which, which, which kind is it? Is it uh, NT or XP or uh, 2013 server, things like that? Then we'd want to know what version it was on. Uh, we'd want to know what patch level it's at. And then we'd go even further, right? We'd, we'd look to see what kind of vulnerabilities are uh, known to exist for that particular version of that operating system. And then we fan out into the applications and do something very similar for them. And then we look at device drivers and DLLs and that level of detail. It sounds um, agonizingly intensive. The reason why uh, we recommend uh, performing that and capturing that information and keeping it up to date, that's the same type of information that adversaries go after and, and use to their advantage. So they, after they've spent a significant amount of time resident in, in uh, target systems and networks, they uh, come up with that information and uh, use it to their advantage to craft their attacks. So you need to know the same thing too. Uh, we put that to use in phase three consequence-based targeting, and that's where we sort of turn the tables and say, all right, now that we've seen, we've created that whole map of the, um, the uh, real estate that the adversary would have to navigate in order to do their, to do their business, we're going to um, uh, find the ways through that maze that the adversaries would take, and we prioritize it from, ultimately from the easiest pass through with the highest confidence to ways that are tougher for them uh, or would take longer or they'd be less confident about. That's informed uh, because INL is part of the intelligence community. It's informed with the latest intelligence on the systems in question. Um, and we're able to present to the customer uh, in a really visceral level of detail. These are the ways through this maze that an adversary would take to, uh, to turn off or damage or destroy uh, equipment that supports your most critical functions. The last step 
is phase four uh, mitigations and tripwires. And uh, here now, once we've shown that there are ways in, uh, as described, uh, we uh, then s turn to the engineers, both our own, but uh, particularly the ones of the customers, and say, um, you know, what, what can we do here to make it so that even if the adversary were to get into the network, were to reach certain target systems, they nevertheless uh, wouldn't be able to create the damage and the destruction that they were uh, seeking to, to create. And, and here we turn to uh, good old fashioned engineering first principles, okay? This can be things like uh, a tripwire, so that if you can think of uh, Stuxnet as a public example, and centrifuges were told to spin, spin in ways way out of tolerance in ways that would uh, would destroy them, you can make it so that if a particular high value, long lead time to replace a piece of equipment is told to us uh, to kill itself uh, by digital by a digital command, that the uh, the, um, the trip wire just says, "Hey, go to sleep, turn off gracefully. We'll do forensics later on and figure out what happened." Uh, but by relying on analog means, which are generally not visible to the adversary coming from a digital pathway, uh, we're able to protect this equipment and uh, learn, live to fight another day. Uh, tripwire is something that I'll refer to in a subsequent slide, but essentially it just means uh, the reduction as much as possible uh, to a particular target. Uh, so that if you had, say, 20 different network paths, uh, that uh, an adversary would have the, the opportunity to navigate to reach a goal. We can, and there, and there are business reasons to have those, or at least there were when they first were built, um, reducing as much as possible the number of pathways in because it's so much easier to, to monitor fewer of them than it is to try to keep a constant eagle eye watch on all of them. In many cases, the uh, company isn't even aware of all the different paths uh, the, the, into a particular target system. So. We help illuminate those and then talk through with them which ones could they uh, start to shed without really having a substantial or unacceptable impact on the way they do business. And that's it. That's it in a nutshell. It uh, looks like an assessment. It is an assessment, but it's really intended to be an awakening, uh, a, to be uh, introduction to a new way of thinking about cyber risk and new ways, once it's fully comprehended, of mitigating those risks. Uh, while still allow companies uh, and the military, of course, to fully embrace technology, uh, use the latest and greatest and differentiating um, AI and automation and IoT, IIoT types of technologies, uh, knowing that the things they really have to, that they really rely on most, aren't going to be able to be taken out by an adversary. I mentioned that uh, INL is uh, full of folks who were once on the offensive side of operations. And so um, this slide here shows you something we, we help the uh, client see is what they look like from the outside, uh, how uh, inviting a target they are, even though it feels like by doing comprehensive hygiene and best practices that they're doing a great job and they're very busy and it costs a lot, that's all true. There's still gonna be ways uh, that talented, well-resourced, adaptive adversaries can find to navigate through that hygiene, okay? So when we try to do that prioritization in the very first step of CCE, here's some of the factors uh, that we use for calculating a high consequence event score, right? It's really hard to, to ultimately uh, rack and stack and, and choose the highest priority scenarios uh, without having some type of numerical basis for it. So we ultimately convert in these different categories, starting at the top, the area impacted, how much it would cost to recover, potential safety impacts downstream uh, of, for the public, uh, system integrity aspects, how broad the attack is gonna be and how long the uh, damage would, would uh, cause, uh, how long it would cost, it would, how long it would take to get back on your feet. All these things can factor in uh, to ultimately coming up with a score for a particular scenario. And we use that to help pick the scenarios that we're gonna then advance into phase two, where we do the system to system breakdown, okay? So that's, uh, that's a little bit more detail on that first, that first phase of the methodology. Let me uh, see if I can move a slide here. Uh, let me go back. 
So the previous slide was think like an adversary, and this slide is act like an engineer. Uh, engineers, the uh, best definition I ever heard for engineers was uh, their job is to solve problems. And so this is a problem that if, if cyber, if the best cyber defenses ca can ultimately be defeated by certain adversaries, um, what do you want to do about it? And uh, so here we bring that type of engineering problem solving mindset to bear and uh, bring in not just digital technology, but whatever we have in our toolkit from the past, from the present. Um, these include some analog controls like the, uh, the, the, the analog trip I described, um, potentially introducing trusted humans back into the loop where they were removed uh, because of the uh, desire to uh, be more uh, efficient. Uh, several, several different types of things. A uh, device called an attack surface disruptor that's uh, under development by Tim Roxy and Mike Wallace. It's a number of different options you have here, and many of them are not very expensive for engineering out the cyber risk from things that must not fail. Uh, and ultimately, it's not just for the uh, operators and engineers and the technicians in a company. It's for everybody because you don't want to keep deploying insecure systems uh, for the processes that must not fail. You want to ultimately uh, bake some of this thinking into HR when you're hiring people and bake some of this thinking into procurement when you're buying new stuff or designing a new system. Obviously, most people on this call have probably heard you don't want to bolt security on. You want to have it there from the very beginning. And CCE and another concept, uh, a subset of it, cyber-informed engineering, are the ways that uh, we try to inculcate this type of, uh, of thinking into the, the companies that we end up working with. Okay, I think this is my, uh, my last piece here uh, before we uh, segue over to Phil. Um, absent uh, actual house call from INL, INL is not a, a very uh, big organization. So while we're piloting these things and learning how to per perfect the delivery of a CCE engagement in the electric sector for the military, and over time in other sectors. Um, at the end of the Harvard Business Review white paper that some of you have probably seen, and we can probably get to those of you who are interested in reading it on CCE, uh, here, are some of the, here are some of the sort of basic concepts that you could do now if you're trying to achieve some of these benefits. Uh, first one is to make sure that the message gets through. The CCE is not uh, a call to stop doing the absolute best you can on cyber hygiene and best practices, cybersecurity defense. Got to keep doing that, otherwise you'll be constantly uh, nipped in the heels and um, um, uh, slowed down by the wanna cries and not touches and ransomwares of the day. So please keep doing that. Don't take that other message away. This is, uh, we fully support uh, all the folks that are trying to make better products and deliver better services uh, to help companies out in these areas. Second part is obviously you can see if you've been paying attention related to the first step of the CC methodology, think broadly about protecting everything, but I try to identify to the extent you can systems and processes and functions that you just cannot tolerate an adversary being able to reach and do something to, or at least uh, have the effect that they're trying to achieve that would be a disaster for the company. Start, start asking yourselves and asking around what those things might be inside your organization. And it's not always known to the people at the very top. Sometimes you have to go down a couple layers to fully understand that. Um, this is supposed to be a number three. I'm seeing four um, um, at the top of this middle box here. But I think I mentioned this to reduce the number of digital pathways into and out of a particular process function to the absolute minimum that you can still work comfortably with because it'll be a lot easier to monitor them. Uh, number four, is related to really in the in the sands number one and two of the top 20 know what you have know what you have in exquisite detail especially for the things that must not fail uh, because the other the other organizations that likely will have that information are not your friends and if you're going to be able to com combat them and defend against them successfully you're going to have to know the similar level of detail uh, that they have and then lastly uh, as I mentioned a couple of these uh, throughout the talk, um, if you do find systems that you think are targeted, potentially success, uh, susceptible to a cyber attack that you simply cannot allow to uh, 
to, to run to destruction. Uh, there are some options which we can describe in more detail some other time about backstops. Again, having a, uh, an analog trip perhaps that will help that system shut down gracefully when it's given a signal to uh, act uh, way out of tolerance. And backups, non-identical backups, a plan B that is not exactly like plan A so that the adversary has not been able to go to school on it yet. And even if it's not perfect, uh, it can keep you alive uh, long enough. You can do forensics and uh, push that uh, adversary out of your systems and uh, fight, uh, live to fight another day. So that is the uh, sum total of uh, my presentation. I'm saying thank you to you here, and we're segueing over now to Phil Nire. Thank you, Andy, that was awesome. Okay, so let's keep going here, whoops. Um, so I'm gonna talk about a couple of things. Uh, Not Petya, of course, happened over a year ago, but there was recently an article in Wired Magazine by Andy Greenberg that revealed some very interesting aspects. I'm gonna talk about that. I'm going to talk about VPN filter, which we covered in our last SANS webinar, but there's some new information that we've gotten through Cisco Talos. Um, a company put an ICS honeypot on the web. I know it uh, was a bit controversial, uh, but I think there's some things we can learn from that. And then finally, how all these things relate to what Andy's been talking about, which is consequence-driven consequence cybersecurity. So just quickly, let's remember, why does this all this matter? Well, if you're a security professional or an OT person, uh, your number one responsibility is towards your organization, and there is a business need for digitalization that uh, we're not going to be able to do anything about. I'm not sure what happened there. Let's go up. Uh, Carol, if you could just full screen that, please. Uh, there we go. So number one, we need to support digitalization. It's a way to make our, our processes more efficient and more effective. Number two, there are many adversaries out there, nation states being among them, but there are cyber criminals as well and hacktivists, as Andy mentioned. So we need to think about them. And then finally, what uh, Dale Peterson coined the term many years ago, insecure by design, many of the networks that run our factories and our critical infrastructure were designed many years ago when security was not a primary uh, consideration. And so they're missing many of the things that we now take for granted like authentication and segmentation. So how do you, how do you prepare for that? So, oh, sorry about that, you guys. Um, okay, so let's talk about this NotPetya article. Uh, Andy Greenberg is probably one of the best investigative reporters in security today, and he wrote a detailed article on this. He's also writing a book on Sandworm, the Russian threat actor group that uh, did many things in the past, including crashing the Ukrainian grid twice. Uh, but some interesting quotes here on NotPetya uh, from Thomas Ridd about how this is not necessarily a one-time event. It could happen again because of the interconnectedness of our networks and the complexity, some of the things Andy was just talking about. Um, and then Cisco saying this was not accidental, it was uh, very deliberate. And uh, unlike WannaCry, just as a reminder, not Petya spread through internets. Um, uh, it was Eternal Blue, uh, which was an SMB vulnerability that uh, was stolen from the NSA. Uh, that was similar to WannaCry, it also used an SMB vulnerability, but unlike it, uh, WannaCry, NotPetya used Memicats, which uh, grabs credentials from memory and then uses those credentials to spread internally to other machines that share the same credentials. And that's why it spread so quickly, and that's why uh, it was very hard for anybody to uh, stop it once it got into the network. And there's some examples in the article, including a large pharmaceutical manufacturer that lost $870 million from uh, production that was down and from cleanup costs. Um, so it was a very, very widespread. So you might ask yourself, wow, if this thing spread really quickly, it was a sophisticated attack by a nation state. Uh, it was a, a destructive worm. It wasn't even a targeted attack. How would I protect against it? And I think some of the concepts, concepts that Andy talked about would help here. We're gonna talk about those uh, when we get to the end of the presentation. Uh, we talked about VPN filter last year, uh, last quarter, excuse me. Uh, 
believed to be by Fancy Bear, a Russian GRU organization, according to the FBI. Um, as a recap, it's multi-stage malware that infects routers, uh, tens and you know many many different types of routers. And what we already knew last quarter was it has a packet sniffer for Modbus, which got everyone's attention in the ICS security community. It can wipe the firmware of the devices, so cause a lot of chaos in your environment. And it uses black energy malware, which was the same malware used in the first Ukrainian grid attack. In this most recent update from Talos, we learned a couple of things. There's seven new modules that are part of this malware, so someone took a lot of time and effort to build it. There's an endpoint exploitation tool that looks at the traffic going through the router, uh, inspects it, and redirects it, and could be used to uh, look, for, uh, look, it specifically looks for Windows executables. Uh, and it could be used to patch Windows executables as they fly by. So it's an endpoint exploitation tool built into the router malware. Uh, number two, port scanning and network mapping. We're going to see that this is one of the very first things bad guys do is they look around the network to see what's available, what ports are open, how they're connected. Uh, and it's part of uh, cyber uh focused critical engineering to, to sort of look at what ways attackers would try to move through your network. Uh, an interesting denial of service on specific forms of encrypted communication, like WhatsApp. Uh, the authors of the blog post theorize that's to direct uh, folks to use uh, other forms like, uh, like um, excuse me, I can't remember right now, the one that Russians typically use. And then uh, a number of new ways that uh, the bad guys are using to obfuscate and encrypt their traffic and, and build a distributed proxy network that would hide the source of uh, command and control. So some very sophisticated malware here. And again, I'm mentioning it because it has an ICS focus uh, and it's very possible that uh, many of these even sort of Soho style routers are used in ICS facilities uh, because somebody at the plant decided that was the easiest way to solve a problem they were trying to solve. And then finally, this uh, honeypot experiment, I know it got some flack uh, from some folks, actually including from Andy, who were wondering about details that were missing. But uh, it's interesting that uh, what the, this uh, cybersecurity company did was simulate an ICS environment with a honeypot, uh, the environment had an IT network, or more like probably like a DMZ type zone, it sounds like, and then an OT network with an HMI and a firewall in between, which is how most of our networks are configured. Um, they had three internet facing servers, and we know that RDP has become a favorite mechanism for uh, threat actors to get into our network, specifically for ransomware, but I'm sure they're using it for all kinds of other reasons. Uh, and those ports had weak passwords, and then they registered the DNS names of those servers and used internal names that resembled what they called a well-known electric utility. So all of the things to make bad guys interested. Within two days, uh, these servers were compromised by a tool called XDedic, which if you look up at the top, that's what I saw when I Googled it. Um, so it's a uh, tool that's sold on Russian forums, and uh, what it allows you to do is to um, continue to have the asset owner use RTB, RDP to get into the system, but then you can also get into the system at the same time using RDP to do bad things. And in 10 days, the access to that back door was sold to a new owner, presumably uh, via the black market. So now somebody bought access to uh, an ICS-related asset and began to do multi-point network reconnaissance to look for ways into the OT environment. The blog post doesn't basically doesn't make it sound like they actually got in, uh, but um, we know that this is a very common way for folks to get in, to first get into the IT environment, either uh, using one of these open ports or to use compromised credentials, and then to look for ways to get into IT on, from IT to OT, and many times, there are ways from IT and OT to OT that the IT and the OT organization aren't even aware of. Um, again, uh, you, know, do you know, doors between IT and OT that were opened by folks just trying to do their jobs but not thinking about the consequence. And there's a link down there to the original blog post and also a, a great interview with the research team uh, that you'll find on the CyberWire. 
So in uh, Andy's Harvard Business Review article, he talked about four steps in this methodology. He touched on them in his presentation. The first one is identify your crown jewel processes or your must not fail processes. And depending on the organization, that could be different things. It could be you know, the production line that your company depends on uh, for the bulk of its revenue. It could be um, uh, an ICS asset that if compromised and uh, you know, exploded uh, would lead to environmental damage and safety issues and lawsuits. Um, anything related to your brand reputation or one here that most people don't think of, theft of intellectual property. A lot of uh, interesting information about your proprietary manufacturing processes are stored on the OT side, not just on the IT side. And then compliance violations, the example being, you know, a petrochemical facility that gets blown up or a pharmaceutical facility that's using dangerous uh, chemicals that then get leaked into the environment. So obviously identifying these processes is something that uh, will require conversations with the business and with the OT team uh, and the IT team. And some examples are here at the bottom, including safety systems. The second uh, part of the methodology is map your digital terrain. And here, um, CyberX can help with an automated discovery of all your assets uh, and automated mapping of your network topology. That's what's showing up at the right. Uh, at the bottom left, you'll see information about all the devices that we've discovered, such as open ports. Uh, and then what we often find with our clients is they discover that there are all kinds of ways into this environment that they didn't know about. Uh, wireless access points, uh, VPNs that were set up. Uh, in the middle there, there's a picture of a cable modem. One of our clients actually found the cable modem that had been installed in the environment to facilitate remote management and maintenance by the vendor of certain equipment. Um, so there's all kinds of ways into these environments and in the past, uh, nobody really worried about them because you assumed that your suppliers and your contractors were trusted. Uh, but we now know that um, malicious threat actors will compromise third parties like your maintenance vendors and steal their credentials so they can get into their environment, appear to be trusted employees, but they're really someone who stole trusted credentials. Uh, the third step in the methodology is entitled Illuminate Your Most Likely Attack Paths. I found this uh, interesting tweet here from uh, the Grug, one of my favorite guys on Twitter. Um, and of course, not everybody has the thre same threat models, but uh, there are many ways to do this. I'm sure most of you are already doing it. Tabletop exercises, pen testers, and what we introduced about a year and a half ago, which we call automated ICS threat modeling, in which we not only map the topology, as I've shown, and identify vulnerabilities, such as weak credentials, such as unauthorized connections, such as um, uh, connections to the internet, but we then use that information with analytics to calculate the most likely attack paths uh, on your critical assets. And this is an example here from our console where the uh, person using the product has chosen um, a PLC uh, down at level one and right mouse clicked and then pressed on the button called simulate attack vectors. And then the system goes through and says, what are all the paths an attacker would use to get to this critical asset? Uh, and let's rank them by risk. And that's what we're gonna show you on this slide where you pick uh, your most critical asset, either the way I showed you or in this um, view. System comes back and says, I found three attack vectors ranked by risk. And then it draws a visualization of that attack path. In this case, there was an internet uh, a connection uh, from one of the subnets exposed to the internet, which allowed the attacker to get in and then exploit a number of Windows vulnerabilities uh, in the middle, and then finally exploit a vulnerability in the PLC itself uh, to compromise it. Although we now know that most um, PLCs have vulnerabilities that rarely get patched, and most of them, many of them, have weak authentication, so it wouldn't necessarily re require exploiting a vulnerability. 
you can then go back and simulate what if scenarios for mitigating or remediating this attack vector. So that might in involve uh, better zoning or segmentation. If you can patch some of these intermediate systems, you would certainly want to do that. Um, and uh, you can then look and see whether this eliminates that attack vector, which attack vectors then remain, and then decide if that's a level of risk you're willing to live with. So that's what we call automated threat modeling. Uh, the fourth and final aspect of the methodology that Andy describes in his Harvard Business Review article is called find options for mitigation and protection. And the first thing he talks about is reducing the number of digital pathways to a, to a minimum. Uh, and we talked about some of those unauthorized connections, segmentations, people with remote access that shouldn't, or remote access that's not being properly managed. There are a number of very well-known and very mature privileged identity management and secure remote access solutions out there. Uh, one of them, for example, being CyberArk, and we've integrated the platform at CyberX with the CyberArk um, platform so that we can immediately identify both authorized and unauthorized remote access sessions. And these platforms do a lot more than just uh, act as jump servers. They can also uh, make sure you're not reusing passwords. They can uh, record the session so you can look at what your contractors did when they were actually connected to your OT network. Obviously, there's an audit trail and various other things that are really important for securing remote access. Uh, obviously, one of the ways of reducing the number of digital pathways is addressing vulnerabilities. And then finally, implementing compensating controls. We know you can't patch everything. So uh, you try to minimize the number of digital pathways to your most critical assets. And if there will still be some that remain because a determined attacker will eventually find his or her way to those pathways, you want to put in compensating controls such as continuous monitoring uh, to immediately detect when they've compromised your infrastructure. And I'm going to show you an example of that in a few slides when I talk about the Triton attack. Uh, and then the other thing that we've done is integrate with firewall infrastructure so you can rapidly block sources of malicious traffic. And so here's some examples of alerts. You can see up at the top left, scan device was detected. Uh, as we saw in the honeypot example, uh, it's the first thing the bad guys do. They start scanning the network, looking for information about what devices are there, how are they configured, what ports do they have available that they can use to compromise them? Um, we'll see in a few slides how the Triton attack relied on an update of PLC code, the ladder logic code, to insert a backdoor into the PLC. That would also be detected. Of course, it could be a legitimate update, um, but these things rarely happen, and you have to have a workflow so that when this type of update to the PLC code is detected, you can check with the appropriate OT engineer to make sure it was a legitimate update. Uh, some other things up there, if someone's sending stop requests to your PLC, that should rarely happen. Again, something that you should have a workflow for in your uh, SOC to be able to detect. And then threat hunting is all about going back in time. This is the timeline view. Uh, of alerts and other notifications that you would see in our platform so you can go back and see what else happened around the time an incident happened and uh, this will help you investigate it'll also help you do threat hunting and of course there's a full uh, data mining interface so you can query past traffic for very specific uh, events or incidents based on MAC address IP address uh, commands that were used so you can go back and investigate the incident let me tell you a bit about the firewall integration that we've done with uh, Palo Alto Networks. Um, and this is part of our shipping product today, and that's being used by real world customers. Um, obviously, no one wants to automatically change a firewall rule without having a human in the loop. The issue becomes how do you quickly change a firewall policy um, with a human in the loop when malicious traffic is detected? So, the way it works in the workflow we've designed working with uh, Palo Alto Networks is CyberX sends an alert to the SIM, of course, and at the same time creates a new 
policy for the Palo Alto Next Generation Firewall. So this policy has all of the relevant information about the IP address of the host that we need to block or the port or the protocol that's being used. The human then approves that policy, the firewall administrator, and pushes it either directly to firewalls or in the case of uh, Palo Alto Networks, Panorama is their centralized management interface. It's the enterprise interface uh, to all of the firewalls. Um, and that's the way to block the traffic very rapidly. Uh, let me just wrap up with a quick summary of CyberX. Uh, we were founded by military cyber experts. These are blue team cyber experts who defended critical infrastructure uh, in Israel and have that expertise defending against nation state threats. Our headquarters are in Boston. Our R&D and threat intelligence teams are in Israel. I'm, I'm in Boston today as I speak to you. Three key use cases for the platform, which was purpose-built for OT, asset management, vulnerability and risk, risk management, which includes the threat vectors I was talking about before, and continuous monitoring. It's non-invasive, it's agentless, uh, it uses patented behavioral analytics and self-learning to very quickly learn your environment without requiring any configuration of rules or signatures, and it integrates with your SOC workflows and your security stack. Because as we've seen, uh, attackers will often go into IT and then move to OT. So you need unified monitoring across IT and OT. And we do that with integrating with your existing SIMs and other workflows. We've partnered with all of the major security companies and MSSPs worldwide uh, to simplify your workflows, but also to offer MSSP services to supplement your own internal teams if that's required. Our threat intelligence team has discovered a number of zero-day vulnerabilities in ICS devices over the years, going back to, you can see here, 2015. Uh, we work very closely with the automation vendors to uh, validate the vulnerability, make sure they have developed a patch that they can then issue to their customers before the vulnerability gets released on the ICS CERT website. And we've worked with all of the major OT automation manufacturers for that. Uh, we offer a multi-tier architecture with a centralized management interface to give you a unified risk view across your entire environment, all of your facilities worldwide. And as I explained, it uh, integrates with the systems you already have in your corporate SOC. I've talked about the SIMs. We also integrate with ServiceNow, for example, for ticketing. And I just want to wrap up with uh, this uh, Triton example, which um, Triton was discovered by Mandiant, uh, a unit of FireWire, very well known, when they responded to one of their clients in uh, the Middle East, we later found out in Saudi Arabia. Uh, and um, earlier this year, there's a New York Times article that revealed some new information about this that made it sound very much like, although it's, it was circumstantial, that the victim was uh, a joint venture between Dow Chemical, a US company, and Saudi Aramco, the largest oil company in the world. Um, and we don't really know what the goal was. Uh, we believe it was to disable the plant safety systems, that it was connected to the Shamoon attacks, which were launched by Iranians on Saudi Arabia in the past. And that even though um, it was Iran, it displayed a high level of sophistication and some experts theorized that they got some help from Russia or North Korea. If you look at the way the attack unfurled, looking at here in the Purdue model view, we don't know exactly how they got in originally. We're going to guess that they stole OT credentials either from a contractor, from an employee, and then use those credentials to move through the firewall into the OT environment where they deployed malware on one of the Windows-based machines. Uh, we're guessing here it was an engineering workstation. It could have been an HMI or some other Windows-based machine. It was Python-based malware that was recompiled to run as Windows executable. So this part we know for sure. Our threat intelligence team has reversed engineered that malware. And what we found is that it used the native protocol of the PLC, the safety PLC called TriStation, to upload new ladder logic code into that device and then insert a backdoor 
uh, into the PLC, which resided in the firmware of the PLC. So very sophisticated. They had to know the memory layout of that device. They had to know the exact firmware revision number. And they had to, they, they had to use the TriStation protocol in a way that would allow them to communicate with their back door, but without uh, breaking anything else that was going on in the environment. And we theorized, as I said, that their goal was to actually disable the safety PLC, uh, launch another attack that would cause temperature or pressure to rise above normal thresholds, which would then lead to you know, massive uh, safety and environmental damage. So the way continuous monitoring would help against this type of attack, number one, we detect that remote access connection. Uh, again, it could be legitimate, but there'd be a workflow in place to detect whether it is legitimate or not. Number two, we detect the scanning that inevitably occurred once they established a foothold on that Windows-based machine to look around and see what devices were installed in the environment. Uh, number three, we would detect the update of the PLC ladder logic code that contained the uh, uh, payload to install the back door in the memory of the firmware. And then finally, the protocol that they used um, used the actual TriStation protocol, but with uh, parameters that were undefined by the vendor. So these are parameters that allowed them to communicate to the back door whether they wanted to do a read or a write, for example. Um, but it used parameters that are really illegal according to the way the vendor defined the protocol. And we would detect that as well as pop up that little a button at the bottom called block source that would automatically create a firewall policy to block the source of that traffic. Uh, wrapping it all up, I want to direct you to our uh, knowledge base where you'll find information on our vulnerability research, transcripts from past webinars, uh, the global ICS and IoT risk report, and to encourage you to come visit us at some of these upcoming events. Two that I want to point out, the Palo Alto Networks Ignite Europe conference um, happening next week in Amsterdam. It's going to feature a joint session with one of our customers, the CISO of a leading manufacturer who's implemented our integration with Palo Alto Networks as well as with a number of SIMs, including QRadar. Um, and then the ICS Cybersecurity Conference in Atlanta later in the month, where CyberX and Palo Alto Networks are sponsoring a free half day hands on workshop on ICS security on Monday, the first day of the conference. We're also doing a joint session with Emerson Automation Solutions that'll go through the process. We work with them collaboratively to um, reveal the existence of vulnerability in one of their devices, and we're calling it Building Mutual Trust. I wanna thank you for your time today. I'm gonna to take a quick look at the questions. We only have a few minutes left. Um, and question for Okay, uh, Andy Ginter has a question. Hi, Andy. Um, he says, uh, analog backstops may prevent some kinds of equipment damage because uh, uh, Andy's talked about using analog backstops like real switches or humans. What do we do when a single unplanned shutdown is consequential enough that a business needs to eliminate the possibility of the event? Hmm. Um, Andy, I'm not sure if you got that question. You want to take a shot at it? I heard, I heard you, um, but I'm not sure I understand it. I, I do. I'm familiar and I'm a fan of Andy Ginner. Um, uh, but would you would you repeat it again one more time? It has to. Well, maybe you should. Maybe rather than try to decipher the question, uh, talk about analog backstops and 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 your thoughts on analog backstops because I know you've generated a bit of controversy around those. Yeah, just the idea is that um, my dog's beginning to protest here. The okay. um, the idea is that if, if you can have analog in the mix uh, at some point, uh, uh, it's going to be uh, not visible to the uh, to the adversary. Uh, they won't know that that was something that they had to go to school on. That something resident in or near their target, and um, it can it can be very Sort of nice quiet way in in most cases I, as I, I think i said it doesn't have to be expensive some of the mitigations that were put in place in our first pilot were uh, surprisingly inexpensive and didn't affect operations at all so i think maybe uh maybe uh mr ginger and i will uh hash that out and make sure i completely understand more clearly more fully understand his question uh offline 
<laughs> okay, thanks. And uh, we got one minute left, but I, I, I'm dying to ask you a question about, um, I think you made the point about cyber hygiene. Uh, I think some people might have misinterpreted some of your comments earlier this year as saying cyber hygiene is not important. Do you want to just repeat your thoughts on why cyber hygiene is simply insufficient on its own? Sure, sure. And it, it is so hard to both critique it uh, without, how can you critique something um, without some people feeling like <laughs> taking it to the next, taking it to the logical extreme and saying, Andy says that's, that's stupid, that's unnecessary, it's a waste of time. Uh, that's not it at all. It's that key word that comes after uh, uh, that phrase, uh, critique of cyber hygiene hyphen only strategies uh, for defending the parts of a uh, operation that that cannot be allowed to fail that you cannot allow to be touched by an external actor and so uh if you but if you can imagine you can imagine what uh, would happen what would befall the the large mid-sized and small companies and uh their government counterparts in the US and elsewhere if they were to simply uh say you know what since since somebody uh, some some expert said they can get through my uh, hygiene defenses. I'm just not even going to bother worrying about it at all. Imagine how quickly all your systems in all your departments would stop functioning in a, in a semi-productive way, uh, both on the IT side and on the OT side. Um, I think uh, I'll just have to use the power of repetition. Some mea culpas for when uh, I'm not communicating clearly or I'm forgetting to reemphasize that point got to have the best hygiene you can afford, the best hygiene that you can uh, educate your folks on producing for your organization day in and day out. And uh, I think products like CyberX, the new co cohort of, uh, of interesting OT security uh, companies are all pushing the, the bar uh, forward and um, we're excited watching them and partnering and, and rooting for them. And everybody else that's trying to like, you know, keep themselves secure all at the same time, trying to advance the, the whole community if we can. That's great. Andy, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you to all the attendees. Uh, the slides will be available. The archived recording will be available both on the SANS website and on our website. Uh, one of the other things we do is provide a transcript of the presentation. So if you'd rather just scan the transcript and listen to the whole audio, you can do that. And uh, once again, Carol, thanks for your help. Andy, thanks for your help. Have a great day, everyone. Take care. Thanks, Carol. Thanks, Phil. Thanks, everybody, for listening. All right. And thank you so much, Andy and Phil, for your great presentation and to CyberX for sponsoring this webcast, which helps bring this content to the SANS community. To our audience, we greatly appreciate you listening in. For a schedule of all upcoming and archived SANS webcasts, including this one, please visit sands.org forward slash webcasts. Until next time, take care, and we hope to have you back again for the next SANS webcast.